Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, normally, when you introduce somebody, you read their life history and their CV. But I think our speaker today has a much more distinguished resume. It consists of six years of work, which you can find on the web under the acronym SIGIR, but which, more than that, has been absolutely critical in helping us shape a meaningful effort inside Iraq, come out of a climate in which we were almost completely unprepared for stability operations, and to deal with the social governance, other aspects of aid, to look at civil military programs together. And I think that is one of the more distinguished histories in public service. It is also one which I think is going to be absolutely vital in the years that come. We may remove our forces from Iraq at the end of next year, but the problem of going on with the development of Iraqi security forces, carrying forward the aid programs, shifting from military aid to the police, to a State Department program, finding new ways to treat Iraq as a full partner. If that is possible with a government we cannot yet identify, these are challenges which go for at least half a decade. And it is particularly important, I think, that Mr. Bowen is here to be able to talk about lessons. Because whatever happens in Afghanistan, if we are successful, the most we can hope for is to begin some kind of limited conditions-based withdrawal of troops next year. And that itself is uncertain. But as we look down the line, it is a different country. The lessons here become critical because as far as we can see in the future, we will be paying virtually all the costs of the Afghan security forces, and we will have to sustain a major aid program again indefinitely into the future. This is not a case where you can point, at least in theory, to oil or some other solution. So we are not talking simply about lessons of the past. We are talking about lessons for the future. And with that, let me introduce Mr. Bowen. Thank you, Tony, for that kind introduction. And thank you all for coming out this morning to discuss uh, an issue that continues to be ripe on the front burner, indeed dealt with yesterday on the Hill at a hearing on transition in Iraq. Um, titled, Is the State Department Ready to Lead? Uh, that's a familiar question. It's a continuing question, and it's a structural question, uh, a question that's critical to my job, uh, my job overseeing uh, the use of taxpayer dollars, $53 billion to date in Iraq, uh, equaled now in Afghanistan, and next year we'll go up to $71 billion. So how we do this, how the United States government is structured to carry out contingency relief and reconstruction operations is critical. I'm delighted to be back here at CSIS. I was here last summer uh, as a guest of Ray Dubois here in the back. Pleasure to see you again, Ray. And we were talking about hard lessons, uh, our tome about the, what happened during the Iraq Reconstruction uh, enterprise, good and bad. Uh, and and it, it is the body of evidence supporting what I'll have to say today. So it's available on our website, www.sigra.mil. Um, but we've continued to produce important lessons, learned work, and this year we produced Applying Hard Lessons, which is the shape and structure of my talk today, which is, is entitled From Lessons Learned to Lessons Applied. If we don't apply the lessons of Iraq, if we lose them, as we have, for instance, from, as we did with respect to, um, to Bosnia, a lot of contingency lessons learned there not applied in Iraq, rejected to our loss, to the loss of, of taxpayer dollars. Again, a structural question. Uh, I'm going to begin by talking about what SIGR has been doing 
for the last six and a half years in Iraq, uh, on the ground, uh, across the country. And then uh, a little bit of our results, and then get, get to those lessons, uh, and then, then we'll have a Q&A at the end. Uh, this organization, Special Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction, uh, the one I've led for the last six and a half years, was created by Congress in November of 2003 with the adoption of the Iraq Relief and Reconstruction Fund. 18.4 billion in one fell swoop designed to take Iraq uh, out of its post-war chaos and rubble and, and put it on its feet as a democracy, as an economy. Uh, the results have been mixed, as we all know, and, and not certainly uh, at the level that was envisioned by the Coalition Provisional Authority back in, in 2003. Uh, and the chief reason, of course, has been or was the de destabilization of the country by the insurgency in 2004, 2005, 2006. I was with Ryan Crocker uh, uh, this past Monday down at the Bush School, where he's the dean, uh, talking about this, these very issues. And, and as he told me uh, when we were visiting in, our off in his office Monday afternoon, Iraq went right to the precipice of total loss back in 2006 when he arrived he didn't think that we were going to be able to prevail. The, the surge, of course, it's in all its pieces, not just the surge of troops, uh, pulled us back from that precipice. Uh, but, uh, but we've had to struggle to spend our money wisely uh, and to try and get this democracy going. And here, six months after an election, we don't, it's not functioning very well. There's no prime minister, no presidency, no presidency council. Uh, the latest word that I've heard uh, this week is that potentially uh, Adel Mahdi will be the prime minister, uh, Baram Saleh as the speaker, and Ayad Alawi as the president. Uh, that, that deal is fairly close, but this is, uh, I think, the third or fourth time we've had a, a, a deal that's been fairly close. Uh, that, of course, is the essential next step that has to happen for, the, for Iraq's growth and recovery to, to, uh, to evolve. Uh, SIGR right now on the ground has uh, 15 auditors, investigators, uh, inspectors, and evaluators in country, an another uh, 100 over here uh, in, in Arlington. And we've been productive we, uh, for the last six years. 171 audit reports, 151 million uh, recovered or saved, another billion put to better use. Uh, 43 indictments, 34 convictions, uh, 150 inspections. We've traveled all over the country and, and visited uh, uh, every corner. I, I've been to, to the Basra Airport and to the PHC in Sulaymaniyah, to Mosul, uh, to, to Anbar, and, and seen some good projects like the Anbar Judicial Complex and some failures like Kanbani Saad Prison north of Baghdad. Uh, why those failures? Why, those, why has there been so much uh, lack of coordination, such, such a significant lack of coordination? And, and I would say it's because we've tried to rely on coordination in planning and structuring this reconstruction program, rather than a unified, integrated entity to, to, that is actually accountable, that actually had a plan at the outset that, that was executable. And it, and it actually had authority to manage diverse uh, reconstruction projects across the spectrum uh, within Iraq. We didn't have that in 2003. We don't have that today. Uh, yesterday's hearing on the Hill was, was, uh, was uh, met with a lot of uh, shaking heads from the members uh, because of their concern of the discontinuities between state and DOD's uh, engagement uh, in the transition, and and uh, again, uh, that's 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 not that's a familiar theme. There there have been a number of hearings about that discontinuity, and and ultimately, uh, it will need to be addressed. I believe by serious, meaningful, permanent reform that takes us beyond the adhocracy that characterized how the reconstruction program was managed in Iraq, and towards something more stable. Uh, to, to, to use an apt term, and something that's, that is reliable and applicable in, in any context 
be it as large as Iraq and Afghanistan, which I don't think we'll see again, but perhaps more along the lines of the 15 stabilization and reconstruction operations we've had since the 60s in, in places like Somalia and, and certainly uh, Bosnia, the, the biggest one that we had prior to Iraq. Uh, the hard lessons that we, we pointed out last year begin with one I was alluding to, that, uh, re that, that security is, an, is a prerequisite to any successful large-scale reconstruction, large reconstruction operation. That seems axiomatic, but not evident in, in how we acted in Iraq uh, in 2004 and 2005, trying to, to build the Nazaria water treatment system, a $300 million project, uh, state-of-the-art, uh, in, in one of the most dangerous areas in Iraq, the South Central uh, region, uh, back, back in uh, 2005. Uh, we also tried to bring a system that's, that was not well tuned to the capacity of the people uh, that it would serve, that was not shaped uh, to suit the, 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 the pipeline system that was there uh, at the time. And thus, when it was turned on, uh, finally completed in, in 2007, uh, it, was, it was a bit of a disaster. Pipeline, pipelines in the street just exploded because they, they couldn't take the pressure. And then, the, then when we visited the uh, site back in 2008, it was operating at 20% because the Iraqis uh, who were assigned to run it didn't know how. And as a result of our inspection, floor had to be brought back in and, and a two-year uh, operations contract had to be executed. So developing the capacity of the people and being sure that they're properly consulted and that the systems that we bring suit the situation is a second critical lesson. Security, matching the capacity, ensuring that soft programs uh, are as uh, emphasized from the outset as, as hard infrastructure. That certainly wasn't the case in the initial Iraq Relief and Reconstruction Enterprise. Uh, when Ambassador Negroponte came in, he, he shifted the emphasis, but it, it meant the canceling of hundreds of projects and, and the moving of money around that caused delays and waste that we've seen in Iraq. Um, the, the most significant lesson, though, uh, from Iraq is the need to develop, uh, as I said at the outset, a single entity within our government that has the, the duty, the authorization, the appropriation, the responsibility uh, for planning and executing contingency relief and reconstruction operations and being accountable for them. In, in uh, June of 2004, the system that was adopted in, in uh, National Security Presidential Directive 36 was an ad hoc system that created ad hoc entities uh, succeeding other ad hoc entities, the Iraq Reconstruction Management Office. Some of you remembered, remember that, perhaps served in it. The Project and Contracting Office. The first one, IRMO, was within the State Department. The second one was within the Department of Defense but they both were tasked with managing and overseeing the reconstruction program. And, and what happened was a, a certain rivalry and resentment developed between the two of them. Policy with IRMO, money with PCO, state, DOD, it didn't work well. Uh, there, were, there were things that the ambassador wanted uh, that, were, that, that simply didn't get executed on the DOD side because PCO reported the Secretary of the Army it was a DOD-driven uh, fund source, the Iraq Relief and Reconstruction Fund. Alongside it came the Commander's Emergency Response Program, another $3.5 billion. Uh, and state was over here trying to connect. And so over time, uh, they tried to, to wire up and, and, and develop integration. But did it work very well? No. It's building the airplane in flight and with the pilots changing along the way. Uh, that, uh, that obviously uh, caused a lot of waste and created vulnerabilities to fraud. Uh, and, and we continue to uncover those cases, significant uh, cases uh, just this year in, in, the, hundred, in, the, in the tens of millions uh, that, that, that we, will, we, we are investigating and that DOJ is pursuing. Uh, in, in the handout that some of you, that you, I hope you have, there's a, there's a line diagram that I think is Exhibit A for why, 
we need the kind of reform of which I'm speaking today. It's, it's the uh, management structure for Iraq reconstruction back in 2004. And it just, if, if my uh, verbal description doesn't capture it, that visual will. Um, what I have proposed in, in applying hard lessons and, and, what, and, and what the Hill is really, frankly, gaining interest in is something obviously much more streamlined than that, something much more defined. The U.S. Office for Contingency Operations would have the responsibility uh, in theater uh, for contingency relief and reconstruction operations. It would not be a new layer or a, or, or a, 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 a development or implementation of, of a level of bureaucracy that would interfere with either defense or diplomacy. I think that's one of the criticisms and one we have to take on uh, clear, clearly, uh, it, it would not be a layer because it would bring together the elements that are already out there that aren't integrated, that aren't operating effectively together, and give them a leader, and give them a funding stream, give them a statute, an authorization that's, that clearly delineates what it is they're supposed to do. It would be somewhat like FEMA in that the, the president would declare the contingency underway and that would create the jurisdiction of USOCO and then at the end of the contingency it would be declared over. And, and so there would not be, as some at the State Department have feared, this continuing presence of USOCO interfering with diplomatic endeavors. And it would not interfere with defense operations on the ground. Generals would be in charge of, of combat operations, all security issues. Uh, and it, it would not turn into a longer-term development. So it's not development, it's not defense, it's not diplomacy. It's, it's what I call the fourth D. Uh, and it, it's, it, is, it is a unique aspect, a unique element for protecting our national security interests abroad, uh, and one that we're not well-structured to do. And, that, and, and the consequences, as I've said, still evident even yesterday on Capitol Hill in, in talking about who's going to be in charge of what in the course of the transition. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the reality is, is that, that the administration, specifically Department of State, USAID, and Department of Defense, uh, don't embrace USOCO yet, but they do agree with the problem as we've diagnosed it, that, that there has been uh, a, a complete discontinuity in the oversight of funds, that there, there aren't enough personnel with expertise trained and ready to go to carry out contingency relief and reconstruction operations, that there has not been an IT system that can keep track of what we've even built. Something as simple as that, uh, one of our first audits identified that problem, and the Iraq reconstruction management system was developed. It filled a gap. That's not, that's not, again, not the way you're supposed to do this. And, event, and it, it was able to account for 70% of what we built, but imagine that. 30% we don't know where or what or how it was done. And that, that, uh, that is a, a core weakness that's certainly unacceptable, uh, especially when you're spending $50 billion in taxpayer money, not to mention another 20 in Iraqi money. The Development Fund for Iraq, uh, the United States has also had responsible for responsibility for it to varying degrees over the last uh, six years. Uh, the story there, as a recent audit of ours indicated, is not any better with respect to oversight and management of, of, of that reconstruction money. So there are core weaknesses. We know them. You know them. There, the, the evidence is here in, in, in hard lessons. Uh, what, what, what do we do with that? And, and what does the Congress do with that? What does the State Department and the Department of Defense, the, the leaders in, in these operations, do with that? Well, they are moving forward with reforms, but they're not integrated. That's my concern. And it will perpetuate the same kinds of problems that we've seen in the past. The reforms that are in place are, has been the creation of, include the creation of the something called SCRS, the State Department's Coordinator for Reconstruction and Stabilization. Um, it, it is more of a, of a personnel shop. It, 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 it has pulled together uh, a, a couple of hundred of experts who are being trained to carry out uh, uh, overseas contingency operations. But are they being, really being used in that area? 
the answer is no, not sufficiently. Uh, and, and, and more to the point, even that program is, is, suffers from lack of integration. There's, there's about a third at the State Department, a third at USAID, and a third at the Department of Justice. And, and they are sort of independent operating entities as well. And how many, how many of SCRS individuals have been, are in Iraq? None. How many are in Afghanistan? A handful have been there. How many in Haiti? A handful. So it, it's not, it's not so for, for lack of, of desire, I think, but it's, it's, it's because of the weak structure. I mean, the, these individuals have been trained, but they don't have any program authority. They don't have any operational uh, capacity or the necessary funding uh, to, to get out and do these missions. And as a result, it's, it's, it looks like a tactical USAID enterprise. You know, there's some in Liberia and Peru and Mexico and Bangladesh. Uh, that's, not sta that's not supporting a stabilization and reconstruction operation per se. But it's an important resource, and I would say bring that personnel body together uh, under one mission, under one leader, USOCO, and then you have the core for, for beginning a real uh, new approach to, to contingency relief and reconstruction operations. That's one piece. Uh, I think the, the, another backbone, uh, or perhaps the backbone for this, would be the, the, the civil, military civil affairs reservists. Uh, in, in fact, they have played a huge role in Iraq and Afghanistan, most of them deploying several times, uh, but not in any coordinated fashion as part of a stabilization and reconstruction operation. Carried out the DOD mission, but then also been plugged in on a bit of an ad hoc basis in both Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, there is a better way to do that, and that's to bring them uh, within one team, with one leader, integrated with the, with the civilians, the, the uh, SCRS, and achieve a true civil military uh, operational capability. You've heard, you've heard the phrase civilian surge over and over again. I'm afraid it, it's mostly just, a fr just that, a phrase. Uh, it has, it's not part of an integrated effort to carry out a, a coordinated stabilization and reconstruction operation. Uh, it's, it's a goal, it's a good vision, but the structure is not there. Uh, and, and, um, and I think USOCO could be it. One promising step, I think, towards this kind of integration is, is in the works. Uh, Secretary Gates wrote a memo to Secretary Clinton last December proposing joint funding, where both departments would approve in, in the security sector uh, the use of a, of a significant pot of money to address secure, security issues, police training presumably, and other matters uh, in, in uh, stabilization and reconstruction operations. That's, that, I think that's the first step, but it, again, it's just the funding piece. It doesn't bring together the personnel piece or the oversight piece or the planning piece or the operational piece. piece. The, um, the planning is still done through the interagency management system. At which, in which DOD has a fairly limited role. Uh, and, and, and I think that that system needs to be revised. It's, it's NSC run, uh, it's a coordinative set of staff meetings, but operationally it's con it's, it doesn't connect well to what's happening on the ground in either Iraq or Afghanistan. Um, so in sum, I think the time is ripe uh, this is a golden moment, sort of like 1986 uh, at the Pentagon when Goldwater Nichols changed the way DOD uh, fights wars by developing jointness. And jointness, integration, those are the watchwords uh, that I think need to characterize whatever reform moves forward. You call it USOCO, call it whatever, but it needs to bring together uh, incentives, capacities, resources, and authorities into one place so that for the life of a stabilization and reconstruction operation, we know who's in charge. The Wartime Contracting Commission had a hearing in March and brought rep senior representatives from DOD, uh, USAID and state, and, and asked that question. Who's in charge of the Afghanistan uh, reconstruction program? They weren't able to get a good answer. And that ought to be an easy answer. That ought to be something that you're, you know well before the first boot sets foot on uh, foreign soil and as part of a stabilization uh, operation. And um, until 
the administration and the Congress find a solution, I'm afraid we're going to continue to have hearings like the one we had yesterday, wherein uh, con uh, <coughs> the, the Congress goes away frustrated, feeling that the lack of integration uh, is just part and parcel of how we carry out these operations. So we'll continue. Let me just close by saying that I think uh, there is a strong interest, especially in the House, for implementing something like uh, what I've described today. Uh, uh, Congressman Carnahan, Chairman Skelton, uh, Chairman Dix uh, have all indicated interest in 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 uh, pushing the debate forward through a bill. And so I don't think it'll be in this Congress, but perhaps at the beginning of the next one, uh, we, we may see some meaningful action that will drive this debate and, and create the possibility for a solution uh, to solving and applying uh, this hardest lesson from Iraq. So thank you uh, for listening, and I look forward to your questions. And thank you, Tony, for having me. Appreciate it. Stuart, I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative and ask you a question before I open things up generally. You focused on the need for effective leadership and organization. Let me ask you about two problems that I think most of us who have been in the field have seen continuously now over nine years in two wars. One is that people talk about integrated civil military plans, but when you actually read the plan, there is a military plan and there is a state of civil concepts which do not reflect in either war any meaningful integration within state or even AID. And it goes on and on, and we keep hearing about it changing, but it never does. The second thing is we've been at war for nine years and we are still measuring effectiveness largely in terms of what we spend. In Iraq's case, there was once a State Department maturity model. It was followed by a State Department stability model. And the department has no model, either an AID or a state, for measuring basically what it is doing internally. How do, is that something you can change organizationally, or is it simply a basic problem in core competence within the U.S. government? Uh, I, I think, as was discussed yesterday at the hearing by uh, a number of members, that, that what was asked of the State Department in Iraq and, and in Afghanistan was, was something beyond its core competencies, be, uh, beyond its, its prevailing culture. Uh, and, and, and what that was is overseeing and managing a complex uh, reconstruction program uh, uh, in, in an unstable environment. Uh, that, that, is, that has not been a traditional role for, for the State Department. Uh, nor has it been a traditional role for the Defense Department. Both departments have undergone significant evolutions in response to what was encountered in, in Iraq, but because of the Defense Department's uh, really robust planning culture, its response was, 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 uh, was uh, I think, more effective. Uh, DOD Directive 3000.05, uh, the Stabilization and Reconstruction Directive that Secretary Rumsfeld signed uh, over five years ago, uh, I think, uh, instituted the most significant evolution at the Pentagon in, in modern times, you know, other than Goldwater Nichols. And it, it has developed a capacity to do rebuilding and to, to do peacekeeping of sorts, to, you know, to, you know, perish the word, but, uh, but it is what's been going on, to do some nation building in Iraq and Afghanistan. But it's not, as Secretary Gates has said, a core competency or a core mission of the Department of Defense. And, and he has said he, he would like to see uh, the State Department resourced and USAID strengthened. But those are long-term plans, and those are, those are large requests. Uh, it's more than just money. It, it's, it's about where does this mission fit and who's going to manage it. And, and, that, and because it's not neither defense and neither diplomacy, nor is it development, 
Uh, it doesn't fit neatly with any, any existing department. If you place it at, at USAID, as some have suggested, or place it exclusively within DOD, then, then that, those particular cultures are going to shape the, the mission in a way that perhaps deprives it of, of, of other inputs that it needs. And that's why I pr propose USOCA, which would report to both Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense, like I do. Uh, ECA during the Marshall Plan reported to two secretaries as well, as well, and Paul Hoffman was able to make that work back then. I think this could work, uh, and and uh, but I, I think the, the the long answer to your question, to cut to the short uh, conclusion, is is that uh, that the that the State Department is, is is has not had this as a core competency. It's not part of the traditional culture, and and that that to assign exclusively stabilization and reconstruction operations mission to them when they're, it's a fundamental civil military mission uh, would not solve the problem. Ladies and gentlemen, let me open things up uh, generally for questions. Let me ask a couple of favors. First, please wait for the microphone. Second, please, when you begin, let us know who you are and where you're from. And finally, uh, if the question ended with a question mark and was relatively short, it would probably allow everybody to ask questions during the course of Stewart's presentation. So let me open things up. Uh, Who would like to begin, please? Gentlemen, and you in the second row, just wait for the mic if you don't have it. Sir, George Nicholson with Stratcorp. Last year at a major conference of the National Press Club, General Tony Zinni mm -hmm. was adamant about it's not going to be fixed. State Department doesn't have the initiative. State Department doesn't have the attitude. By default, the military is going to have to do the job. They need to be given the resources and given the task. Along the same lines, you talked about with the military coming out of Iraq, the military going to be coming out of Afghanistan, but the large presence of State Department and other organizations Who's going to support the security, logistics, force protection, uh, and communi communication support? A very tough question. Now, the, the State Department has asked for $6.3 billion for next year. It, it got a, a chunk of that already in the supplemental, including $725 million for security. Uh, Deputy Secretary Liu, uh, now at OMB, uh, testified in support of that request that it was a quarter of what he thought they would need. So talking about almost $3 billion just to do security, which is about half of their money uh, uh, requested for, for FY 2011. Um, is that enough? I don't know. Uh, you know, I, we just don't know what the security situation is going to be. What we do know is the backdrop that the military has provided for movements across the country is going away. Uh, is 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 significantly gone, for that matter. Uh, it, it was it wasn't hard to catch a helicopter to where you needed to go for the last six years. That's changed, uh, and uh, the the security situation this summer in in Iraq, as we saw in Fallujah just a few days ago, uh, very problematic, of great concern, and and certainly raising a. Uh, bad memories about what happened in in 2006 after a six month. Uh, governance gap. Remember, there were the the last elections were in December 2005. The government, the Maliki government, didn't actually fully form until the first week of June of 2006. And in that period, the Golden Mosque was destroyed, and, and a massive insurgency exploded. Uh, that, that's not quite what's happening now, but uh, you know, on, by any other standard, Ar Iraq is, is 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 a place that would be unsafe for for U.S. civilians to operate. Uh, we, we're just adjusted to to uh, the conditions there. Uh, to, to answer your question, who's going to provide it? Well, the State Department's going to have to do it. Is, is $3 billion going to be enough? Uh, are they going to be able to do their job? And that was an issue that came up yesterday at the hearing as well, if whether, whether uh, civilians are actually going to be able to engage with Iraqis at the provincial level uh, is, is, a, is an open question because of the continuing security concerns. Uh, in the back row there, the gentleman. Uh, Bill Courtney, retired from the State Department. Uh, the administration has been working on a long-anticipated PSD-7 on assistance and a quadrennial diplomacy and development review. 
those would seem to be uh, vehicles to consider the ideas that you have, uh, you have proposed. Uh, are those ideas being considered? Yes. And we met with Anne-Marie Slaughter and Secretary Liu, and, uh, and as I mentioned during my talk, they, they uh, agreed with our diagnosis of, of sort of the ten problems that exist regarding the management of of stabilization and reconstruction operations. Uh, they, they think USOCO is an interesting idea, but certainly have not embraced it. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm not surprised at that. And as I pointed out in applying hard lessons, uh, it's, to a certain extent, this is a turf issue. It's a money issue. And, and, uh, and those, uh, uh, it's difficult to find interagency agreement when those issues are at the forefront. I, I think, as with Goldwater Nichols, a solution will have to come from the Congress. Uh, hi, I'm Ellen Lapson from the Stimson Center. Um, as Iraq offices across the system sort of move back to being sort of under regional offices, so they're no longer reporting directly to the top, I wonder about the status of the special IG and whether there's any plan eventually to uh, treat Iraq like other countries with respect to sort of under the authority of the normal State Department IG mm -hmm. process and whether the mission of your office is essentially that historic period, that huge you know, reconstruction funding that had so many problems that yes. you've so uh, well studied now, or whether are you currently serving as a current IG for ongoing activities in Iraq? Uh, yes, we ha well, first of all, first part of your question, uh, we have a, a closure and transition plan that's, that's underway, and, and SIGR will conclude by the end of 2012. So lots of work will be still be handed off, especially on the investigative front. We have um, hundreds of new cases in the pipeline as a result of our forensic auditing review. Uh, but other agencies will take those over uh, uh, in 18 months or so. Uh, but yes, there's still significant uh, money, 6.3 billion uh, under, under our aegis uh, coming into uh, Iraq, according to our statutory authority, the, the money that is appropriated to support uh, the Iraq program is within within our jurisdiction, and so so we have um, some very interesting audits uh, coming up uh, in in this quarter. For instance, a review of the National Democratic Institute's management of grants, uh, following up our, our IRI review from this last quarter. Um, we have uh, a review of uh, the special operations, the investment in the Iraqi special operations uh, forces, uh, and we have uh, an, a, an, a, a kind of a closeout audit of how the money that was seized during the invasion, that 1.5 billion, what happened to all of that? How was it used? Was it stewarded properly? Uh, so just a good, good cross section of the kind of work and the diverse jurisdiction that we have. Um, the, the, as part of our last phase, this last 18 months, uh, I've also I've concluded our inspections regime and began an evaluations regime. And so we're going to, over the next six quarters, issue an evaluation every quarter, looking at big picture issues, outcomes. And in, our first one will be uh, in, out in, at the end of October, an interesting one on big infrastructure projects, specifically looking at the Nazaria water treatment system, the single largest project that we did, $300 million, and Erbil which was also a top five project. Uh, one in Kurdistan, one in, in the south, and so it'll be an interesting contrast, and we, we've done surveys of the population, uh, trying to get at what effect, what impact did these significant projects have upon the Iraqis themselves and served by them, and have some, some uh, I think, some uh, fascinating conclusions for everyone to see when, we're, when it comes out. Sir, sure, if I may just follow up on Ellen's question, uh, the State Department first had what was called the maturity model, which was more a public relations effort to prove we had developed Iraq and could leave. Then when that was rejected, they went to a stability model, which was supposed to actually measure and evaluate effectiveness, which is not the function of the State Department IG normally. As I understand it, that stability model essentially is in limbo, which means neither state nor AID 
will have an internal mechanism for measuring the effectiveness of its aid in civil programs. Uh, is that where we stand at the moment? I think a good answer uh, is found in the reports of the USAID IG's uh, reviews of of uh, the the CAP, the 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 program, very large uh, civil assistance program, and and a number of other grant programs uh, that have spent billions uh, through something called TOT. We are in in Iraq, and and uh, the IG's point is exactly the one you're alluding to that 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 the emphasis of those programs has been on outputs rather than outcomes and that, that the discerning effects now that's, that's sort of the purpose of this aid program to have a positive effect uh, have we had that positive effect can we even find out whether we've had that positive effect I'm afraid those remain question marks uh, and and I think the the uh, USAID IGs made uh, leveled some fair criticism on that front uh, the lady in the second row Hi, I'm Alex Boucher. I'm with the Center for Complex Operations at the National Defense University. Uh, are you going to be doing any work on PRTs uh, as part of the upcoming work you just mentioned? Uh, we've done a variety of audits of the PRT program. It's uh, winding down, so we don't have anything specific to PRTs uh, in, on the audit front. Um, we have related issues that PRTs touch that, that we'll, be, we'll be looking at specifically uh, the the QRF program, uh, quick turnaround project, sort of the State Department analog to SERP, uh, mostly uh, overseen by PRTs, and um, we'll, we'll have an audit on, on that either either in October or in January. Uh, the PRT program is is devolving away, as you know, uh, into a dur enduring presence post. I think there are 14 now. Eventually, we'll. Uh, move or, or devolve into four uh, enduring presence posts in consulates. See the lady in the back there? Nancy Berg from the Project on National Security Reform. Mm -hmm. I, I wondered um, whether it's looking like the Hill is going to be having some ways of looking at this in an integrated fashion. I don't know what your arrangements have been uh, in your current position, but I'm wondering if if there's uh, any kind of change that's needed up there to oversee something like this that, that I think is a wonderful idea, your, your idea. And, and I'm also wondering about the budgeting, whether there would be any hope of having some kind of an integrated budget to, um, to fund this or whether it has to continue to be stovepiped. Yeah, on the budget front, I think uh, the, the, the step that uh, Secretary Gates and Secretary Clinton are taking on the dual approval for security spending is a good model to expand to, to uh, a full stabilization and reconstruction operation approach, similar to, to what DFID does in the United Kingdom using conflict pools, um, and somewhat analogous to sort of Stafford Act money, you know, how, how FEMA had, gets access to its money once a disaster is, is declared through the Stafford Act. Um, and your, your point's well taken on the stovepiping, I guess, that you're referring to regarding uh, committee oversight. Uh, it, 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 this, this does merge jurisdictions uh, or, or, or bring them into conflict, depending on your perspective and, uh, and, and whether and where that this reform would unfold, be it in, in, the, in a foreign affairs or, or armed services committee, is a, is a question for, the, for, I think, the members to figure out. But... Chairman Skelton and uh, Congressman Carnahan, chairman of the of, of uh, House Armed Services and a senior member of, of the House Foreign Affairs, are in sync on this point. And um, and Chairman uh, Dix uh, agrees as well. Uh, but um, each of them are struggling with that very point where it fits. Let's see the young lady in the second row. Hi, Cameron Middleton with Barrico Technologies. Um, I just had a question about your comment on IT solutions mm -hmm. and sort of jumping off from where we are with the QDDR versus USOCO debate. Do you think in some level while this debate continues, it would be helpful for us to push harder for 
common civil military operating solutions to inject those lessons learned into CERP decision makers now you know, to combine what's, what Sydney and Dura and Tabulae, excuse me, for Afghanistan, are already trying to do to help make more informed decision makers by the people who are really at the grassroots levels. Yes, absolutely. If something like USOCO doesn't happen, then something like what you're describing has to happen. In other words, addressing the ten problems that are out there, which are problems of discontinuity and conflict and, uh, and weak coordination. Uh, if we can't get to integration, the coordination has to improve uh, in IT. And I didn't mention especially contracting. Uh, I mean, the, the FAR is the governing mechanism, but each agency has its own version of the FAR operative on the ground. And, and in our Second lessons learned report uh, from from 2006 on contracting. We recommended the development of of a um, contingency FAR, one that that all agencies would use in in a stabilization and reconstruction operation. Uh, that met with pretty much uniform assent as an as an idea, but it but it hasn't been implemented yet, and and thus the contracting problems that that have, that plagued. I think the early Iraq program uh, still still daunt uh, what's going on in Afghanistan. Gentlemen, the back row. At CSIS and formerly for more years than I care to remember at AID. I was wondering if I could uh, ask you to comment on three themes. The first is your very first point about security being a necessary precondition for reconstruction. Second, the PRT issue. And thirdly, the outcomes question. Tony is asking, and that is that we're del you're talking about environments that don't admit of any of these things, and there are conflicting, ten conflicting principles that uh, govern these reconstruction efforts in these kind of insecure military type operations, where the military needs certain kinds of things, the civilian people need other kinds of things, and the two never quite get joined up. And I wondered if you had any larger comments about how this can work, how can a reconstruction program work, forgetting the organization and the, and the coordination or integration, can you do this kind of thing in an environment in which you have such different tensions between the principles guiding, in effect, the overall effort? Yeah, I, yes, I think you're talking about the tension inherent in COIN, sort of the US, the military's approach to, to stabilizing uh, uh, a, a uh, hostile environment, and then the stabilization and reconstruction operation, the, the, uh, the sort of the civil vert side of that coin, <laughs> no pun intended, uh, and, uh, and and I think that's that's going to require planning, joint planning ahead of time. You know, it's not something that you're going to work out on the ground uh, while as a as a brigade commander spends you know ten million dollars in SERP uh, in a PRT leaders zone without the knowledge of that PRT leader and then and then you have a a mayor or or a, a provincial council member come knocking on his door saying when are you going to finish my courthouse actually a real story from Hilla uh, that I encountered in in our in one of our PRT uh, reviews and and that's that's unacceptable that sort of discontinuity uh, even though there was no ill will it's it's a function on on anyone's part in the, in that discontinuity uh, it, there, there needs to be visibility uh, and systems oversight uh, that, that avoids uh, creating the, the confusion on the ground for, in this case, the Iraqis in Hilla about what the United States was providing. How do you do that? Well, you, you have to have a, a level of integrated planning in place before you get to Hilla, uh, before, before a brigade commander rotates in and, and and is lobbied by, by the provincial council member to do X, the same thing he lobbied the previous brigade commander on and maybe didn't get, uh, without talking to the PRT leader who, who, did, who, said, who didn't have the money and didn't want to do it for whatever reason. Uh, there are a lot of moving parts, and it's hard. You're right. I mean, that's, it's your, the, your, your, the premise of your question is, is how do you reconcile uh, uh, these, these differing departmental approaches and, and, and strategies? And, and I think it, it, that's why it requires something new. I, I think coordination alone hasn't worked sufficiently well. Let me pick up on that. That talks about our internal problems. And in Iraq, 
your experience was dominated largely by the USAID effort, although you did report on international efforts. Mm -hmm. When you look at Afghanistan, a very large number of the PRTs are foreign. And you have a situation basically where many of the foreign country aid missions do not even talk to their own military, much less to the Afghan government or anything else, and where UNAMA, in theory, is in charge of coordinating the aid activity, but has never issued a report on any aspect of aid activity and has never been involved in any effort to audit any aspect of UN operations after nine years of war. Uh, if we solve the problem for the U.S. side and we are involved in international coalitions in the future, how do we deal with the reality of the international side? Well, when I briefed the USOCO concept to Stefan de Mistura when he was head of UNAMI, I think he's in Afghanistan now, uh, his response was, was basically hallelujah. He said, if, you, if this gets before the Congress, call me, I'll come testify in support of it because this is, what, this is uh, an, en an engagement, uh, an approach uh, that, that, the, that the UN would like to see within our, uh, the U.S. Uh, Stabilization and Reconstruction Operations Doctrine. Um, you know, obviously, your point is he, they're not doing it very well themselves, uh, but I think that, that USOCO has enormous potential for generating uh, better planning, better integration, not just domestically but internationally by, by um, having a well-developed doctrine, a well-developed planning scheme, uh, uh, sufficient appropriations to support the resources necessary to execute, uh, and 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 one that also I think is is policy-wise um, wisely framed uh, to to present a, a send a prudent message, so to speak. I mean, the the danger here is is building a, or being perceived as as building a, a colonial office of sorts, and that, and obviously that's. You got to, we've got to err far, far uh, towards the middle. If Colonial's over here and laissez-faire is over here, USOCO fits somewhere in here. Uh, and that's going to require um, international engagement and explanation and clarity uh, in, in doctrine uh, to, to avert misperceptions of that sort. Uh, let me, there are three people who have their hands up. Let me ask each of you to just raise the question, Stuart, if you don't Okay, mind. sure. I don't know what your Great. time is. I'm, I'm fine. Please, first, the gentleman in the third row there. Hi, I'm Will Embry, a former Foreign Service officer now working for DynCorp International. Uh, I, I agree with you completely that the only way that USOCO is going to happen is through Congress. You know, you need a champion. You need a Goldwater and a Nichols. It doesn't sound to me like you found those champions yet. Is that true? Well, Chairman Skelton is a is a is a pretty good champion. Uh, Mel Carnahan's a very smart guy, and uh, I think fourth on the foreign affairs. But but do I? I don't. You know, Chairman Berman's Berman staff is is uh, very intrigued and interested. Uh, on the Senate side, we've we've got a, a wide range of interest, uh, but we're not as close to uh, to a potential bill on that side. I think it will it will probably start in the House. Uh, I mean, there are there are Congressman Granger, uh, Congressman Rothman, uh, Congressman Moran. A, a variety of of members have have uh, expressed strong interest in in. Uh, in, in pushing forward a solution. They are pretty much in universal agreement about the diagnosis of the problem and of the need of some reform. Uh, and, and, and then I would say interested in USOCO as a possibility for that. Um, whatever you want to call it, I'm fine with. It's just there needs to be, as, I, as is the title of this talk, an application of lessons learned. Otherwise, it's, it's, it's history. It's not, uh, it's not productively uh, um, applied to, uh, to, to how we're going to carry out stabilization operations in the future, and we will. This is, I think, the leading edge of protecting our national security interests abroad in, in the modern age. The gentleman in the center there. Hi, Charlie 
Kais from uh, CNN. Thanks. Mr. Bowen, thanks so much for this, and thanks mm -hmm. for all your years of, uh, Thank you. of hard work. Uh, can we just go back one more time to the, uh, the hearing yesterday and the earlier question? Is the State Department prepared to lead uh, once that military withdrawal deadline uh, occurs? And are you suggesting that State really has to make some hard decisions about scaling back its plans and, and what do you think about the alternative argument that they ought to beef up, uh, a dramatically increase the number of contractors that they'll have on board for security, transportation, et cetera? Uh, as, as was discussed at the hearing yesterday and as I presented, uh, there, there's, not, there's not just one answer to that because there are so many aspects to the question. Uh, but the context within, within which I presented my testimony I think is highly relevant, and that is the Iraq program is evolving from a, a stabilization and reconstruction operation mission to a, a more regularized foreign aid approach. We're not there yet. 6.3 billion is, is a huge sum, uh, you know, even, even in uh, Iraq reconstruction terms of where we've spent 53 billion already. Uh, but, you know, the, as has been the case throughout the experience in Iraq, the overarching question is security. Uh, will the environment be stable enough to carry out the assistance missions that, that the State Department and USAID wants to? And, and I, as I said earlier, uh, the, the lack of, um, of a coherent and operating leadership uh, or within the government, uh, the lack of a, a prime minister, most specifically, uh, raises, you know, casts a pall. Over, over all other questions uh, today in Iraq and raises concerns that the, the, the attacks like we've seen in Fallujah and that we've seen in Baghdad and Anbar and in Diyala in Mosul uh, over the last six weeks will, will continue uh, to increase in frequency and destructiveness. And, and, uh, and that's, that's called losing ground. Uh, and, and, and we, you know, we're, I think we're we're, st we're still moving forward in Iraq, uh, but not at the pace necessary to secure success. The army of contractors? Well, yes, be, uh, simply because uh, it uh, is the precondition for st State Department civilian employees uh, to execute their job. As I said, the military has provided this somewhat invisible backdrop uh, that has enabled movement and engagement with Iraqi provincial accounts, councils uh, all across the country. Uh, that uh, capacity will now move to uh, contract security, and, and whether it will be sufficient will be conditions-based, and, and I have real concerns about that. I think we had a last question in the back over there. Thank you so much. Good morning. My name is Allison Johnson. I'm a former USAID implementer uh, and now work for Northrop Grumman Corporation, building a smart power initiative around supplying contractors for the Department of State, USAID, et cetera, in this field of reconstruction. And I'd like to return to the Inspector General report around the $53 billion that you've been studying to really ask some hard questions about the results to see if you could provide for the American people a sense of where we are able to stand in the results that were generated. Did you have some kind of measurement that X of the billion, X of the 53 billion uh, generated numbers of jobs or X number of facilities? And then can you compare the numbers for the Department of Defense where the Inspector General referred to about 10 billion this year that they couldn't account for for money spent within the, the region to see if you had any similar statistics so the American people can have a clear sense of where our tax dollars have gone. Thank you so much. Yeah, that second point is our recent audit of the development fund for Iraq. Um, oddly, nine billion again. Some of you might remember almost the now urban legend, but, but the missing nine billion dollars from our, from our January 2005 audit regarding the CPA's management of funds transferred to the interim government of Iraq for their administration. What we found there was, was not that it was lost or stolen, but that the accountability measures were very, very weak, that the CPA didn't follow its own rules regarding contracting, and um, other than a spreadsheet of showing transfers, um, 
there was very little to show for results, your first point, about how that money was used. This latest report, sad to say, is an, is an example of less, a lesson not learned. That what happened after the CPA went away, the Coalition Provisional Authority, uh, the, uh, Iraq, Iraq, the government of Iraq uh, agreed that, w that the United States should continue to manage significant billions of dollars in, in development fund for Iraq for, for projects and programs, mostly security. And it was the Department of Defense that had charge of that, turns out to be another $9 billion. And it turns out that the required rules for, for accounting for that money were not followed by DOD. And, and I'm most concerned about the about two point six billion of that amount that it wasn't just, they just didn't follow the rules, but they we weren't able to get any documentation for it at all, and uh, and so we're still following up. I mean, that's a, those are open findings, open recommendations requiring reconciliation of the use of that money. Results. That's why I've created an evaluations department within my uh, office, and we're going to be generating a. Uh, every quarter uh, for the next uh, 18 months, uh, results-oriented analysis that says, uh, you know, what did the Iraqis get and what effect did it have upon uh, their living conditions? It's, it's a very important question that needs to be answered before we're done. So I think we have one more question in the back. Yes. Greta Holtz from State. Yes. Hi, Greta. Um, in your vision for USOCO, do you have a vision for um, weaving in the host government in the planning and looking at what you're doing overseas? I mean, one of the things we learned in Iraq was if the Iraqis weren't in on it from the beginning, right. it was not going to last, it wasn't going to work, they didn't want it, we wanted it more than they did. So in this model where you have the, I guess, USOCO um, organization overseas, mm -hmm. is there a vision for having the host government, the central government, as well as perhaps provincial input from yes, the beginning? Yes, absolutely. Greta just got back from managing the PRT program uh, in Iraq for the, for the last year and uh, did a great job over there. It was a pleasure working with you. Uh, um, yeah, it's a core lesson from, from the Iraq experience is, and you lived it, you've heard it from Iraqis. If, if you work in Iraq you, you, they, they, and, and you talk about the reconstruction program, they come up and say, well, we didn't want most of this, or we didn't want that project. Khan Bani Saad Prison, $40 million uh, in, the, in the desert, wasted north of Baghdad, and the de Deputy Minister of Justice, when we interviewed him, said, why'd you build this? You know, we didn't want it. Uh, and, you know, uh, I don't know what the exact ground truth is on that because people talk but, uh, and say what they want uh, late in the game. But nevertheless, what is absolutely true is the need that part of the doctrine of USOCO, part of the doctrine of stabilization and reconstruction operations has to be uh, that the program that's developed and implemented uh, must fundamentally be shaped by uh, what the coast countries' capacities are, you know, first and foremost, they may, in many cases, the Iraqis wanted state-of-the-art. Uh, and in, in, in a number of cases, we gave it to them. They, can't, they weren't able to operate it. So you have to, you have to build to what they can do. Uh, and then, uh, and, and rather, you know, I mean, the, frankly, the Uncle Sugar effect was in full force for a long time over there. I mean, they, 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 wanted, they wanted to pay for everything. You know, this is the most generous program in U.S. history until Afghanistan passes it next year. Uh, uh, but consultation means intelligent consultation. I guess that's a, that's a good corollary. Uh, find out what they want and be sure it's really what they need. Uh, and, and, and somewhere between wants and needs, get to a program that's smart and doable. Do you want, sure. to, do you want to go sure. on, Stuart? Sure, sure. We, can, get, we can continue until we run out. Thank, thank you for taking my question, sir. I'm Ray Denunzio. I'm with the Inspector General for right. Afghanistan Reconstruction. And I'm very interested in hearing your comment with regard, and this is a follow-on to Greta's question. Uh, you spoke about sustainability and capacity and it being a lesson that hasn't been applied all the way back to Bosnia. Obviously, we're facing that in Afghanistan as well. And I'm very interested in your comment with regard to a current consideration of the administration of putting more of the U.S. Reconstruction money into the hands of the Afghans, into mm -hmm. the ministry levels, and allowing them to make the decisions on what the infrastructure needs are that they have and allowing them to actually marshal those resources to the best of their own capacity 
Um, is, that, is that a solution to this problem, or is that fraught with more issues of accountability for U.S. reconstruction money? Well, as you know and I know and we live, uh, it's the latter. Uh, the, the, the central prerequisite uh, to, to that sort of initiative is effective anti-corruption uh, capacities within the host government. Uh, it's not the case in Iraq today. And corruption is still a huge issue, uh, and certainly not in Afghanistan, as your reports have shown. Uh, and um, and so I think it's 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 fair to say that would be a premature uh, implementation of policy. So it'd be nice to, to to go that way, but but I think frankly that audit that missing nine billion dollars audit that I referred to earlier, the one from 2005, is an example of of th throwing money over the fence too soon, not just money, but billions, uh, into, into the hands of a government that doesn't have the capacity to police itself, nor the culture uh, to, to, uh, to root out corruption. And, and I'm not naive enough to think that we're going to change the bakshish culture, uh, but, but what, we, what we have to be sensitive to is, one, these are taxpayer dollars, so we have a, a level of stewardship that, that transcends uh, sort of the, the, the policy apparatus in place over there. We have, to, we have to be able to assure the taxpayers that that money is going to be used properly. And, and two, we have to then get to a point where grand corruption rather than petty corruption is stamped out. Uh, you know, petty corruption, I think, is part and parcel of everyday life. It's, it's a commission process, frankly, on the ground. But the stealing of hundreds of millions of dollars, this has happened in Iraq and, and I think in Afghanistan as well, uh, means that um, uh, we have to be extremely cautious uh, with the taxpayers' money, especially in in an era of you know fifteen trillion dollar debt and and a recession. Yes. One more in the back. I'm Nina Serafino with the Congressional Research mm -hmm. Service. Um, forgive me, I don't remember the name of this organization, but in Iraq. Um, under DOD, there is an office that looks into business affairs, um, and it's being proposed at the same kind of office for um, for Afghanistan. The Task Force for Business Stabilization there Operations. There you go. Thank you very much. I'm wondering how you think that worked and whether that's an appropriate um, activity for DOD. Uh, I know General Petraeus is very high on it. And, and believes that it that it uh, achieved some good outcomes in Iraq. I think there there was lots of engagement. At the actual, at least from our reporting, and, and uh, we've reported on TFBSO and in our quarterly reports. So if you want to see the charts, you can go to to our latest quarterly. Um, but the 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 execution of contracts, which I guess is the metric, uh, since it's it's really not a business oversight; it's a business stimulation program. The execution of contracts vis-a-vis -vis the level of engagements is, is a relatively small percentage. Um, you know, I, I think uh, the uh, trying to stand up a democracy, get a, an economy going, and, um, and stabilizing civil society is a multifaceted effort that requires innovation. And I think TFBSO is an innovative, if at the outset, uh, somewhat disruptive uh, effort. Uh, I know that within the embassy there were views that that was that was um, State Department within the State Department's aegis, not the DODs, uh, and I think that's one of the issues that USOCO would address. It, it, this this is the whole this is the rub of this entire uh, matter uh, that that these are civil military operations, uh, but but these departments are quite different cultures and they 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 haven't traditionally operated quite so closely ever before as they have in Afghanistan uh, and in Iraq, maybe cords in, in, in Vietnam might be a good example uh, of similar engagement. But, but this, is, this, this seems to be uh, certainly the rule of, of modern uh, engagement of protecting our national security interest abroad. And, uh, and I think uh, that we have to thus find something new to address how these interests are effectively integrated, then operationalized. And it begins with planning, and it begins with funding, it begins with authorization, uh, and, 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 
and this 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 sort of planning and, and authorization can certainly include something like TFBSO uh, within it, uh, rather than having it, as some in the State Department viewed it, forced upon them. Let me make this the last question. The gentleman in the center, second row. Uh, thank you. Keith Henderson with American University. Uh, pleasure to meet you. Thank I you. I teach a course called Global Corruption and the Rule of Law, and I'd sure. like to invite you out to speak to sure. my class sometime. Happy to. Um, my, uh, I wish you luck on your integrated planning and oversight um, mission. Uh, I have my doubts um, no. after having Fairly worked, placed. <laughs> worked in this field for a long time. I work on anti-corruption programs as well. Um, and my, but my, I'm getting down into the weeds a little bit, but I'm just wondering, uh, especially as a preventive measure, uh, I know you specialize in forensic audits, and mm -hmm. uh, what do you see the role what kind of whistleblower system does Segear have, and uh, what kind of whistleblower system uh, would work in a place like Iraq and Afghanistan? Uh, could that have an impact on uh, your mission uh, if, if it were improved? Well, Thank we you. run a hotline, and, and the, uh, the hotline has been widely publicized since the inception of the organization, and we've gotten many, many leads uh, from that hotline. Um, you know, the hotline is, a, is an all-comers you know, all uh, approach, and so, you know, over half those actually don't fit into our jurisdiction or fit into uh, a case. Uh, but we have had uh, other whistleblowers come in. Matter of fact, uh, probably our biggest single case, the Stein Bloom conspiracy in Hilla back in 2004, we put uh, nine people in prison from that um, about $100 million crime total. Uh, came from a whistleblower walking into our office into in the in the uh, Republican Palace uh, along the Tigris in, in Baghdad, and uh, uh, actually stories in in Hard Lessons chapter uh, chapter twenty one. Uh, if you want to read about Stein Bloom, it's it's a it's a interesting insight into into uh, how corruption happens in a war zone. Uh, but whistleblowers out thus are important to IGs carrying out their mission, and um, uh, it's been difficult in Iraq because Iraq's a dangerous place and whistleblowers are afraid, and, and as I've heard just through the grapevine, people watch our door and keep account of who's going near it, and, and that, that, uh, so it's a, it's a fearful place, uh, not our door, but <laughs> the environment, uh, because uh, um, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, there's still a lot of guns out there. Thank you very much. I think that all of us appreciate the time and certainly the depth of information. And ladies and gentlemen, Great. may. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tony, and thanks all of you all for coming out this morning.